Church, so glad you guys are here with us and you braved the elements to be here. So in case you missed it yesterday, I think we had a little bit of everything. We had some wind, some thunder, some lightning. Um, so we can safely say that we've made the shift to the next season. So, um, but yeah, you guys are here and I'm here and, and God is here. So really excited to kind of walk through this passage with you guys and to undo some of the cliche, maybe sometimes we attach to it. I know it's familiar. Um, if you've been to a wedding before, you probably see it in a picture frame in someone's house, which is good. Those are good places and good uses, but there's so much more, so much depth to this passage that I'm just, that God's been just kind of telling me, and I'm, I'm excited to share that with you guys. So, but before we read our passage and then kind of um, talk about our game plan this morning, uh, Dave taught us on the previous passage last Sunday, and there's something that just has been kind of rattling uh, in my head this week as I've been kind of chewing on that and looking at the, the um, chapter 13. Um, and, you know, he was talking about the whole concept of unity and, and, and what Paul was talking about. And, and he said something that I'd never really kind of phrased or heard phrased in this way, and it was dependent that the church is dependent on diversity. It's an element that's, that's needed, that's required, that has to be there. And I thought that is such a cool way to look at it because it's not just, you know, diversity for the sake of diversity. You know, that's become kind of a big phrase you hear a lot in schools and in workplaces. You know, I think it's much more deeper and it's not just something to say, you know, yeah, we've got a little bit of this, a little bit, but it takes all of that to make our fabric. And then I looked at who's here, who's part of Trellis. And, I, and there's so much uniqueness in this body that I'm just blown away. I'm not just talking about gifts or talents or ways people contribute, but just personalities, experiences, just life moments that makes it such a rich and beautiful um, tapestry to be a part of and to benefit from and hopefully to contribute to. So, so I hope you guys were encouraged in that last week and I hope it elicits kind of a response to maybe look inward and say, yeah, what is my uniqueness and how do I use it? How do I uh, bless that with the church because we need it. We're dependent on it. And Nicole kind of said the same thing during the, um, our benediction last week. So I hope you guys had some of these same conversations in your head this last week as you thought about uh, the passage Dave taught us through. So, um, so as, as we mentioned this week, we are going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as Paul continues to outline for us perhaps his most poignant contribution in his walkthrough of the spiritual gifts, which is kind of interesting because he's not talking about a spiritual gift at all. He's talking about a calling when he's talking about love, which will kind of parse some of that um, as we walk our ways through it. So, so if you do as we normally do every week, rise with me. And if you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Corinthians 13. If not, it's going to be on the screen. I'm going to read it um, through the uh, ESV version, and then we'll pray and then we'll begin. The way of love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but mysteries, or, or, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we, and we prophesy in part, but when perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even even as I have been fully known. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you just uh, speak to us this morning, Father, as we look at these words, as we try to understand um, what you're conveying to us through Paul. May you just help us to just undo some of our own, maybe definitions or, or, or predisposition to love and how we define it, how we practice it. And, and I pray, Father, those of us that have not received love well in our experience and journey in life, that there would be healing in these words, Father, that there would be hope in these words to understand and to know that 
through the church community, if we do it the right way, we can love each other as we were meant to be loved, Father. And so I pray that you would just be here and do a good thing in our midst as we um, just, yeah, see what you have to say to us. We love you and pray this in your son's name. Amen. So as I mentioned, you know, I kind of like to have a plan before doing things. Not always, most of the times. Um, I was... (laughs) I was trying to think like, yeah, what, when, what, what are times I don't really plan things out and it usually doesn't happen the way I wanted it to happen, which is shocking, right? Um, during my time away, which I'll talk uh, about it at the end of the sermon on my sabbatical, I decided to kind of redo our garage a little bit. You know, after you, you've been in a home for a while, your garage just becomes like a, the giant drawer in the kitchen where you pull out and there's just everything in it. And I'm just like, every time we're in here, it's just this beautiful mess, chaotic mess. And so I started to redo some of it. And then, you know, I didn't really have like a full game plan. So I just started to kind of pull things, donate things, throw away things. And then I I found myself almost trapped in the garage. I couldn't bring any of the cars in. I couldn't go out the door back into the house because there were just piles everywhere. And I thought I probably should have planned this out a little bit more. So those of you that think I always plan things out, not not the case in that in that time. So um, but here's kind of our plan this morning. We're going to do kind of a verse-by-verse walkthrough as we unpack Paul's words, culminating in our response as a body and as individuals, hope, hopefully leading to change. Because if that's not the point of studying the Bible, I don't know what is. Amen? We've got to respond to it as individuals, as a body. That leads to change and not just a head nod. So let's begin. The main theme, obviously, is love as, as Paul begins this section. And I think, again, I think we can all agree that love is the central core of this passage and really of the gospel, you know? And, uh, you know, we think of verses like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God's love for his creation is so prevalent in all of scripture. And it's really, if you think about it, if we stand back and kind of um, focus out, it's really the glue that binds thousands of years in its scope, manifesting itself ultimately on the cross in the greatest act of love to be never repeated. It's really amazing. I know a lot of us who have kind of delved into um, apologetics or, or theology, we kind of see some of the points that, that say, look, this book expands over thousands of years, but yet the central theme, the central message, this kind of the journey stays intact. And I think if you look at it, it's, it's that love that God had for his people that helped him pursue us, helped him pursue the Israelites throughout the Old Testament and then the New Testament and then opened it up to the whole world. And so it's really cool to kind of think about it in that way. Um, and, And that's why Paul expands on the virtues of love by giving the readers perspectives on ways to practice it. He doesn't just kind of share some, you know, little bits and pieces, but he really kind of helps us to understand what it is and what we do with it. And he also tells us what it's not, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll get into also. But before we go any further, let's see what the first three verses of the passage have to say to us, because I think that's a really pivotal point before we kind of get into some of the um, uh, details. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a a clanging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. The ramifications of what Paul is saying here are tremendous. Let's for a second place ourselves as his audience in real time. Joseph, the first couple of weeks of the series kind of help us understand the context of where Paul was, who was he talking to, what were some of the dynamics. But just to kind of recap real quick in our time here so that in case you missed that, you have an understanding. But basically his audience was a makeup of almost an entirely Gentile Christian population, which means non-Jewish in in a very well-to-do city. It was a port city. There was a lot of wealth, a lot of power. Um, but the church was growing and the church was expanding expanding rapidly, but it was also caught up in either abusing biblical practices or in kind of an upmanship in when it came to some of their uh, spiritual gifts. And so Paul is talking about this right after he's done un- or t- t- teaching them about these things, he kind of makes a little turn and says, let's go back to what you really need to be, who you need to be, who, what image you need to portray to your fellow man. So Paul, before even going into the concept of love, establishes its supremacy by undoing 
all of the other aforementioned gifts as useless and even in vain if practiced outside of the boundaries of love. Again, just really amazing to think like he just finished telling them like, yes, this gift, that gift, you can do this, you can do that. And if God can bless you in this way and that way, but if you do it all out of the boundaries of the love that God is talking about, it's useless and it's in vain. In just three verses, he unravels the marvelous gifts, faith that um, we all aspire to, generosity that is extreme in every sense, and self-sacrifice as a martyr as useless if practiced outside of love. I just like, yeah, I can park on that for weeks to think about how many of those things we sometimes tend to cling to. And those are the things that define us. Those are the things that we find our identity in. But sometimes we forget love is the purpose. Love is that core, that reason that we have these gifts. Unfortunately, the dynamic that Paul, um, that Paul talks about is in his direct approach still plagues us today. I think we still struggle with this as individuals. I think we still struggle with this as a church. But we can all relate to getting caught up in the pursuit of practicing our faith while omitting love from our approach and settling for judgment, retribution, or a hollow expression of our faith outside of the boundaries of love. If you can't relate to that, then I don't know if you're human because we all tend to fall in that trap sooner or later. Church, I implore us not just to read this, agree, and move on. These three verses are so powerful in reminding us of something, again, simple yet profound. I know in my journey, there have been and most likely will be times when I so easily leap over love and fool myself that I'm still aligned with his ways. But then when I look back, I'm startled by the lack of the love shown to an individual, to a situation, to an opportunity. And for that, I do repent to my church. There's a lot of times I just skip over the love portion and look at what needs to happen or what needs to be deflected or you fill in the blank. I can do better. We can do better in remembering that the way of love is that the, if the way of love is not our anchor, then everything we're doing is really in vain. If we take Paul's word as truth, which we do because all scripture is truth. So if we omit love, then everything we do is really in vain. If there's one aspect of the human nature that we all struggle with, it's got to be patience. We're going to talk about two of the virtues that Paul kind of outlines for us here before we, he takes a turn and kind of says, what isn't love? Um, but I think if, 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 if there's one thing everyone can say a, a huge amen to is, yes, I struggle with patience. Now, you may say, well, I know patient people. And to that, I would say they're just better at hiding it or internalizing it right? Because <laughs> we all simmer either internally or externally. It's just, it's just part of how we're wired for better or for worse, and it's usually for worse. But seriously, if we think about it, our struggle with patience is completely embedded in our selfishness, which finds its roots back in the garden, which is the result of sin, right? That sin occurred because of the selfishness that Satan kind of woke up in Adam and Eve. So let's look at a story in the Bible that demonstrates this, this dynamic so well. You guys know this story well. The prodigal son um, is one of my favorite absolute stories or parables that we find in Scripture. It, it's got so many layers of God's character and us and how all that fits together and just the beauty of love and grace, even though it's unfair. And there's, you know, sins of the heart and there's sins of the other son and then the father figure. I mean, it, it's just it's beautiful in its in it's just how many layers, again, this story has. But we're going to look at it in the sense of, which I hadn't really done before, until just a couple of weeks ago, when it, you know, as a demonstration of patience. Um, when the son, it's in Luke 15, uh, verses 11 to 32. We won't read all of it, but I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a recap about how destructive the lack of patience can be. So when the son asks to receive his inheritance early, instead of waiting for it, as no, it would have been the custom, we see the path of destruction that resulted from his lack of patience when it's all uh, scoundered on wild living. He loses everything. In a sense, the son's lack of patience was a lack of, of faith and trust in his father. We've got to tie those elements together. Lack of patience was his lack of faith and trust in his father. He wanted his money now. He wanted it right now. And he went and squandered it and came back empty-handed. For you see, when we practice patience, we're exercising faith in God. It's not just this skill or this inner thing that we get better at, but it's really an extension of our faith in God. It's not a separate entity. 
as Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So again, we go back to patience does equal pleasing God, which is through our faith. We know that waiting patiently, having faith that God will fulfill his promises here on earth and in the ever after is quite pleasing to God. We read that in Hebrews. So now we can develop. So how can we develop this virtue? Um, this is where you would say, well, try harder. And I would say, no, it's much simpler than that. It's not about trying harder. It's about doing four things that I'm trying to develop a practice of as a person because I still find myself struggling with patience because I have a short memory. Here's the four things I want you guys to think about. Appreciate how patient God is with you. Again, if you can't relate to that, I don't know if you've got a pulse. If we look at just 24 hours of living, we see so many times where God was just patient with us. He just stood there, let us do our thing, and then came in and reminded us of his love, grace, and forgiveness. Remember how God has been faithful in the past. Again, short memory. We forget his goodness. Trust God for the present and the future. Not just God, be with me today, provide what I need right now, but I'm going to trust you with tomorrow, the week after, the next month, the next year, and count your blessings. That's a hard one because, again, we focus in on the things that are not there or that are not going well or that we're struggling with. But I guarantee that if we all sat down and wrote a list of the things that we're grateful for, that list would dramatically outnumber all the things that we regret, wish were different, or that we had shown uh, lack of patience through. And I, if you've never done that, I've done it a couple of times, it's pretty overwhelming. You will run out of room in your journal or whatever you're typing or writing on. If you write all the things that you're grateful for, I guarantee the list of things that you're struggling with or are just hard and challenging will be so small in comparison. Now, most of you, I imagine, again, know the, how the story of the prodigal son ends. But just in case, let's look at it. This is the son talking um, after he's squandered all, all his wealth. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while his son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran through his arms around his neck and kissed him. Again, Luke 15, 18 through 20. This is the CSB version I just read. And I, one of the things that I read in a book um, called Prodigal uh, God is he talks about how his dad wasn't just out that afternoon by accident or by coincidence and just happened to see the son approaching the house. We can assume that the dad did that e daily. Every evening he would go out there looking for his son because he hoped and prayed that he would come back to him. Not so that he can say, I told you so. Not that, not that he could just say, what, where's all my money? What did you do with all the wealth I gave you? But just to take him back in and remind him of his love for, for his son. I just, just, yeah, it's one of my favorite stories. So if you've not read it, I encourage you to read it. Um, and that's the same kind of love God is calling us to, that Paul is going to be talking about. It's that love that it, it's, just, it's so beyond what we can comprehend and offer that, that we kind of get a glimpse of in this story. So let's move on to our next virtue, which is kindness. So we talked about patience a little bit. We talked about how patience equals having faith in God and remembering all the good things and remembering all the ways he brought us through seasons, which should increase our patience. Um, but the Bible repeatedly tells us to love our neighbors more than ourselves, to help strangers and to live out our faith with kindness. There's endless stories that, that again, develop this virtue also. Should not, so it should not come as a surprise that in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 tells us the, that the way of love is also through kindness. When it comes to how we treat friends, family, and strangers with kindness, sometimes we miss the mark, sometimes by a little, sometimes by a lot. So our challenge is how do we fully integrate this virtue into our everyday lives better, more consistently, the way God has called us to do? But before we go further, I encourage us not to confuse kindness with a couple of things, being nice or being tolerant. That's not what scripture's talking about. Being nice and being tolerant are easy and surface virtues that often provide a shallow experience for us and those on the receiving end. 
Kindness is a whole different thing. So let's go back to the Gospel of Luke and visit another familiar story. Most of you, again, will be familiar with this. In chapter 10, we come across an extra um, ordinary example of kindness in the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to read it for us, and again, the CSB version, and also be on the screen. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He asked him, How do you read it? He answered, Love your neighbor with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love the Lord, I'm sorry. And your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going by that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw that man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day took, to, took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. <laughs> I love this parable for a lot of reasons. In this, this short parable covers a host of cultural and ethnic, dy eth uh, ethnic dynamics that Jesus just mows down in his answers to this expert in the law. He just literally just unravels history like it's like nobody's business. As the expert is seeking validation for his own works, which we can assume was towards people of his own elk or people that he agreed with, Jesus completely transforms his assumption of who is his neighbor, who, who, who his neighbors are in just, again, a few sentences. It's the person that was too impure for the priest to bother with. It's the person from the wrong tribe for the Levite to care about. It's the person from another ethnicity who is at the complete odds with the one who ends up actually helping him. It's the Samaritan with all the wrong social cultural boxes ticked again that shows kindness to the stranger. And let's not forget that he not only helps this man, but he really helps this man by completely going out of his way and expending a large sum of money, which I think is the equivalent of about two to three hundred dollars today to help this guy. Again, a total stranger. But how many of us can we say that we have shown that level of kindness to a stranger during our lifetime? I know our body here is incredibly generous and kind, but I think personally, I'm ashamed to say, I don't think I've quite gotten to this level yet after 33 years of following Jesus. I've never taken someone off the road and said, let me fix you up. Let me clean you up. Let me drive you to somewhere where you can get food and, and rest. And by the way, whoever's doing it, here's some money. Take care of this guy. I'll be back tomorrow and make up any of the difference that may be there. Maybe some of you have done that. Maybe some of you have experienced things like that, but I personally have not. And I'm ashamed to say that because we read how Paul this, or how, um, Luke is describing to us this story through Jesus' words about actual kindness and what it means in practice. And I know some of you say, well, that's not really practical these days. Is it? I mean, I think it is in some ways. It's got to be because it's God's word here. So how did this Samaritan show such kindness? And I think Jesus gives us the answer. He saw himself in the man. He walked by and said, what if that was me? What if I was by the roadside, all bloodied and bruised, would someone come and help me? Would someone come and clean me up and take me somewhere where I can get rest and, and I can get fed and I can be taken care of? And I think that's what prompted him to do it. We don't know anything about this guy, but we know that he showed incredible kindness. He didn't judge. He did two things. Instead, he empathized and he responded with kindness. Often we excel at empathizing, right? Christians are really good at saying, oh, I'm so sorry you're going through that. I'm going to pray for you. But when it comes to some, sometimes with the response, with the responding in kindness, we fall short. 
we just trust that the person's going to be okay. We just trust that their needs are going to be met. We fall short. Again, we empathize well, but we fall short when it comes to responding. But church, I think about, uh, think about it in this way. We're called to show the kind of kindness that was shown to us on the cross. Think about it in that sense. We are called to show the kind of kindness that was shown to us on the cross. Because Jesus didn't just lift us up, cleaned us up, and took us to an inn. He's the one who shed the blood. He's the one who redeemed us from where we were while we were still sinning to be fully redeemed. That's the kind of kindness this stranger showed. It's all part of the pursuit and journey to grow in these areas. I get that. To integrate our faith into our lives as, as chapter uh, 11 in Hebrews talks about. And I, if there's extra reading you're looking for, I encourage you to read that this week. Chapter 11 of Hebrews does such an amazing job of kind of tying all these things together about how we actually practice them as part of our faith. Um, but there are things that we should think about. There are things that we should not take so lightly when it comes to being patient and kind and really think about ourselves, what the depth that's there, the depth that sometimes we scratch on the surface, but then kind of back up and do the easy thing and do the, the thing that we see the most of around, most others doing around us. But think about it if we radically transformed our way of uh, practicing patience and kindness. Do you think that would catch on? Do you think others would see that and replicate that? I think they would. I think it'd be so inspiring and yeah, convicting, sure, but not guilt. Conviction is way different because that elicits another sense of uh, response, but it's what we're called to. So then Paul, again, as we um, move on from our two virtues, makes a little bit of a turn and he talks to us about what love is not. And this is the hard part of the passage, by the way. <laughs> as the passage continues, Paul shifts gears from here, um, again, to, to tell us that the things that are love is not. So he says, love is not envious or prideful, rude, stubborn, irritable, resentful, rejoicing in wrongdoing. When I read these lists uh, a couple of weeks ago, as I was pondering and thinking and praying through this passage, um, a term came to my mind. I, I don't know uh, if it's because I've seen way too many uh, military movies or police shows, but it's the phrase conduct unbecoming. Have you guys heard that phrase before? <laughs> I think most of us are familiar with it, but I thought this is kind of the Christian's version of how we practice or how we fall into that category. It sums up well in all the instances that I recall when I was envious, prideful, rude, stubborn, irritable, resentful, and even rejoiced in wrongdoing. In all of those moments, I chose to unbecome a redeemed sinner made in God's image and settle. Settle for a person who fully embraced the inner self and did what felt the best at the moment. Only to be left with a hollow and fleeting sense of self-worth. That's the cycle. I, hopefully you guys can relate to that. Every time we choose to practice these anti-love things, I don't know what, how else to kind of phrase or categorize them, but that's how we become. We become the selfish, inner-focused person that at the end of the day is left with this, this hollow feeling. And it's a feeling when we experience only when we find ourselves outside of his ways. It's that simple, church. When we display these emotions and attitudes, we choose to unbecome. We make a conscious choice to unbecome the redeemed child that God died for. Sure, we can justify our behavior, as, as I have many times, with nonsense like, it's who I am. It's the stress I'm under, right? It's your fault, and so on, and so on, and so on. And I say this with my wife in the audience, so she's going to come back later and, and remind me of because it's, this is being recorded, I think so. <laughs> but it's honestly true. It's, we've used these excuses before. We've said, well, it's just who I am. I'm, I'm wired to not be patient. I'm wired not to be kindness. I'm, I'm prone to uh, envy. You know, I'm prone to this. I'm prone to, they're all excuses. When we say these things, we're choosing to live outside of God's design and embrace something that feels good to us as, a, as an individual. And then what we're left with that hurt loved ones and individuals around us, and also, again, with that hollow, shallow feeling of a person. But it's a cycle we repeat often when we fall into these traps. Though these excuses, we choose ourselves instead of the blood of the lamb who was slain for us. We choose destruction over life 
I don't say this to be overly dramatic, but it's the reality of the exchange we initiate. When we practice the opposite side of the kind of love is talking about, we choose destruction, relationally, or maybe sometimes even more. But just when things seem bleak, Paul masterfully comes back from all the anti-love behaviors he just listed and gives us the antidote for combating all of them. Now, verses six and seven say this, love rejoices with the truth, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. When we transpose Paul's list of anti-ways of love in verses six and seven, we're even, uh, it's even more profound for me. I don't know how many of you guys make lists and kind of try to do either pros and cons and, you know, should I do this or should I do that? I kind of did it here. I don't know if this is correct. I don't know if this is how you see it. Uh, this week's uh, study sheet actually has a blank version that if you're going to do this as an individual or in your groups this week, in your community groups, I I'm curious to see how you guys would connect these things. But this is how I see it. Envious and prideful believes in the greater one than ourselves. Rudeness endures rather than return, return or re reciprocates. Stubbornness, we can fight it by believing in the uniqueness of others. Irritabil irritability bears all things and is able to deflect. Resentfulness, you can fight it with hope in the work that has yet to be completed. Rejoicing in wrongdoing, rejoice with the truth. That one's an obvious one, right? Rejoice with the truth even when it's hard. Paul is literally giving us the antidote of all the things that erode us from within when we really embrace the inner self and practice all the anti-love ways. So when we find ourselves at the crossroads of our way of love, God's way of love wins every time. It's always the better option. Maybe not the easiest option, but it's always the better option. But the choice is always ours. And that's what makes following him such a sweet proposition. I know sometimes we say, God, why did you give me free will? Why couldn't I just been programmed to act a certain way, speak a certain way? Why did you give me the ability to choose? But that's the beauty of it, church. He made us who we are because of the uniqueness. And he knew that if we truly love him, it would be because we choose to truly love him, not because we're doing it out of obligation, guilt, or threat, or force, but sheer choice. And choices that free rather than bind, which is another layer, layer of beauty. Choosing the lasting over the fleeting. And Paul continues with the rest of the passage. He says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away, verses 8 through 10. Having just laid out the various kinds of gifts in previous parts of the letter, again, we mentioned earlier, Paul now completely again knocks them down because they are not meant to endure or last compared to the power of love that never ends. I don't know if you've thought about it in that way, but I hadn't maybe thought about it in a long time. A lot of the things we strive to or want to grow in or pursue they're not lasting things. They're good things, right? They're not bad things, but they're not lasting things. And the ones sometimes we neglect the most, which is love, patience, kindness. He's telling us, do that, because that, that lasts, that is forever. That's what Jesus is looking for when you see him. The kind of love he's describing here is the kind that outlasts everything else that we accomplish or aspire to. It's completely tied to the perfected, which is Christ's return. That's what he's referencing by saying um, when the perfect comes. When we see Jesus, that's what he's looking for. How did you love? Did you show kindness? Were you patient? How did you love? Did you help the man that needed help? How did you love? Now, we're going to say, but God, I can speak in tongues. But I have the gift of healing. I have the gift of prophecy. How did you love? What are we going to say? It's the way we practice love that Christ will care about and not the kinds of gifts we practice or even long for. He even goes up a step further with the next verses. 
When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Holy moly, there's a lot to connect there, but it's, again, just so beautiful to think about. This is Paul talking, by the way, so let's keep that in our, in our point of view. This is a guy that, you know, is responsible for a large portion of the New Testament, but also the one to first admit, I am the chief sinners among sinners. So an incredibly humble, but yet incredibly just was used by God in so many amazing ways. And now he's saying, look, you know, yes, we're children and then we grow up and we're, we're supposed to do other things. But his pursuit above all is how he loves. For because his reflection is dim right now. And I kind of looked that up trying to understand what the original wording was. And, and a lot of the commentary said he, the reference was back then mirrors didn't exist. So how people used to uh, create reflection was polished metal, basically, which didn't give you quite a shining reflection. It was kind of dim. It was a little bit obscure, but it, that, that's what Paul is talking about. He's saying, we, we're going to go from that to this incredible mirror that is like 1080p, or is there one higher, Zach? I don't know if that's 1080p is out or still in. Okay, higher. So the, okay, so whatever the newest version is, it's going to be full HD. We're not going to be able to hide anything. God is going to see us in every pixel that he created us in, but in person. <laughs> and Paul is saying, look, focus on that because that's when you will be fully known as he's fully in front of you. As Paul supersedes love above all the spiritual gifts, he now raises the bar even more for those that consider themselves grown-ups in the faith. There's a beautiful play in Paul's words as he describes growing up in his faith, not just in the pursuit of practicing the tenets of his faith or his spiritual gifts, but fully displaying God's love and transforming his reflection again from dim to fully lit. We can say fully lit on stage, it's okay. <laughs> but think about that picture analogy. You go from this obscure, I, I, okay, I'm old enough to remember TV where the picture was not very clear. <laughs> You know, like you could be like, what? what am I looking at here? You know, and then today where you're like, oh my gosh, I can see their skin pores, you know, but that's the kind of transformation Paul's talking about here. We're going to go from this obscure dim to fully realized in front of Christ. And again, what that version is, is going to depend on what we bring with us. Is it just a bunch of works? Is it a bunch of knowledge? Is it a bunch of, I did this, I did that, I, I helped this, I did, or is it, I loved well, I love like you told me to love. That's what he's talking about. Reflecting God's glory because of the practice of his, of his ways of love. We will fully know him and he will fully know us through this kind of love. I don't know how many of you have read books by Gary Thomas, but he's a pretty prominent Christian author. And my sister sent this quote to me um, a couple of weeks ago. And I, w I didn't even put the two together until I was fully like pre prepping, prepping the sermon. He says, uh, sensates understand that Christianity without beauty and experience becomes a disembodied religion of the mind. Sensates, Zach knows this because the youth studied this last year, are people that are really hyper uh, geared to, to sense things and to really like touch and feel and all that stuff. And if I'm killing that word, forgive me, Zach, but he'll explain more. But the quote is, is beautiful because it says, sensates understand that Christianity without beauty and experience becomes a disembodied religion of the mind. So if you take love out of everything we practice, everything we do, it just becomes a disembodied religion of the mind. Let's not do that, church. Let's not do that individually. Let's not do that as a community. It's the beauty and experience through the way of love that sets aside our faith from everything else in this world. You can argue till you're blue in the face, but I will die on that hill. It's the beauty and experience through this way of love that sets aside our faith from everything else. Now, Paul ends the passage with verse 13, which is still great in itself. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. With his last remark in this section regarding love, he uses a frequent theme that you'll see in his letters if you've read them, of faith, hope, and love, making up his three Christian qualities. But he distinguishes love as the greatest. Now, some of you read this and begin to automatically hum the Beatles song, All We Need. 
is love, right? Which is a fine song, but it's unfortunately bad theology because that's not all we need. He does not say love is the only important thing. Rather, he says now faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. He distinguishes, but does not undo the importance of the others. Because there's a lot of, there's a movement in the church, there's a movement in the world that all we need is love. We just need to love one another. We need to love each other well. Yeah, sure, if we're looking at the biblical sense, but not at the cost of all the other things, not at the cost of truth, not at the cost of Christ as the center, but it's love that brings all those things together and it's love that God looks for when he sees us face to face. So this means that Corinthians and us must have all these three things, as I said, but the way of love is superior to all of them. Church, the way of love is not easy. I can admit that. I think most of you can admit that. It takes effort and practice, but it's so worth it. It's obviously not emotions, but it's action. Now, the King James Version, as my old mentor used to call it, the authorized version, in our passage, the word love is represented by the word charity, an action and habit that is sacrificial and driven by compassion and not emotions is the dictionary definition. Our resident theologian, Kai, texted me this a couple of weeks ago, and I read it. And I'm like, yeah, so what? I mean, why is he sending me the passage I'm teaching on, but in King James? And obviously, I totally looked it over and didn't realize that he doesn't even use the word love. The word charity is used in its place. What's charity? An action and habit that is sacrificial and driven by compassion and not emotions. So we just undid that whole notion of all we need is love, just to feel good about each other and make each other feel good. It's not that. That's not what Paul's talking about anyways. Because the way of love takes effort. But think of the reward in reflecting his image when we're face to face and resting in that. If I asked you right now, as I've asked myself, when I see him face to face, what do I want to reflect back? I want to reflect back his image. Because that's what I was created in, right? We were created in his image. And for me to reflect anything back would be very sad. Th that would be less than that, would be very sad. As I mentioned, um, I had just a huge blessing to have a sabbatical recently of about 10 weeks, and, and it was just amazing. Uh, I, I didn't know I needed it, and I didn't know how to practice rest, but I managed, and I, I did stay kind of busy. I, I stayed productive in a lot of ways, but in good ways, in fun ways. Um, and, and developed kind of a different rhythm that, you know, there was kind of a mourning period. My counselor's like, now when you go back to work, remember, you're going to be sad the first week. And I wasn't sad because I got to be around coworkers and you guys and, and get back to the grind. But there was a little bit of a mourning period, like, oh. And I wasn't sleeping until like 10 a.m. and watching Lord of the Rings all day. Like, I thought about doing that, but I'm like, no, that, that's going to be a waste. I can do that uh, other times. But, but it was just, it was fun to develop a different rhythm but with that space that was created in those 10 weeks of, of taking a big chunk of the day that was, you know, towards, uh, focused towards work, something special took place that I'm still kind of unpacking and trying to kind of wrap my mind around. Um, it was an understanding of his love. And maybe for the first time in my faith, I found rest in just knowing that he loves me. It wasn't based on accomplishments, on events, on discipling or teaching, but just the sheer fact that outside of everything that I've experienced, his love for me is supreme. Even if all those things are taken away or forgotten, his love for me would never diminish or be inefficient in any way. It's a love that would carry me in every season through any obstacle or challenge. His love is enough. How he loves me is enough. Oh, I so needed to learn that church. So I ultimately find rest in, which I'm continuing to learn and grow in. So thankful to those that made it possible. I know it was a huge load for the staff and a lot of the volunteers that just owned launching Alpha and doing our midweek programming and still acclimating to a new building and onboarding a school that meets here during the week. And and I was just like, I'll see you guys later. I'll see you early October. Enjoy. But it was because of their sacrifice that I learned, maybe relearned this, or maybe even for the first time realized that his love is enough. Even if you take everything else away, 
His love is enough. Church, it's that kind of love that we're invited to participate in. And if we truly desire to be like him, then it's what we are called to practice. It's what we are called to really sacrifice towards. I'm going to have the band come back up and we're going to go into a time of communion and, re and reflection. But before we talk about the Lord's Supper, I do want to share with those that don't quite understand where they fit in, in the grand scheme of God's plan. Maybe you're here this morning and you're hearing these words for the first time, or maybe you haven't heard them in a long time. And I think for us, a time of communion is a time of reflection. It's a time of that inner just focus of what's going on, what needs to change, what needs to be shed, what needs to be laid at the altar as we remember what God gave to us through his death on the cross. But if you're here and you're wondering, I haven't been loved or maybe I haven't loved well, I want to tell you that God died for you because he loves you. And however you are in this building, however you came through those doors, wherever your heart and mind may be, it can be better. If you've never done it, if you've thought about it, if, you've, if it's been a long time since you did it and you have no idea what you did, I encourage you to accept him today as your Lord and Savior and to trust him because his kind of love is nothing this world can offer. It's nothing any other faith can offer. It's nothing any other person or pursuit or longing can satisfy. It's his love that will make everything right, even in its chaos and mess. It's his love that will bind you to his body. It's his love that will set you free. So I encourage you during the next two songs, as we're partaking of the elements, to pray, come find me, come find someone else. I'm going to be sitting right there. And we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to answer your questions and, and explain to you what it means to walk with him because we're still figuring it out, but we know that the truth is the truth and nothing can change that. And for the rest of us, we get a time to respond. We get a time to partake of the bread and the juice that are on the tables next to me. So what we usually do is just during the next two songs, stand up and, and go to the table as we're led, as we think is the right time when you can partake with people around you or you can go back to your seat and partake. So however you do that, I encourage you not to do it out of habit. I encourage you to do it out of a response to the ultimate act of love that we're still trying to understand. That still seems so odd that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us on the cross, a brutal death, but he did it because he loved us. So let me pray for us and then we'll worship.